This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast reducing all the variations within our infotainment diet to a single partially analyzed stream. Today we'll be discussing the purpose and status of local news. I'm Mark Lintonmeyer, your eye in the sky, looking down at the huddled masses from my ivory tower. I'm Erica Spires, holding up my 12-point buck. And I'm Brian Hurt. And really, isn't all of our news local for people who are tuning in from Mars? And welcome to our guest, Dion. Introduce yourself. I'm Dion Broxton. I'm a reporter with NBC Montana, but I'm better known as the Bison Guy. Have you have you added that as an official middle name? I actually don't like it, but I have to accept it. <laughs> oh, you don't? I'd rather be known as a good journalist than the bison guy. Well, of course. I guess like all these things, if it wasn't for the bison thing, we would not have heard of you to be able to say, oh, this would be a cool person to have a conversation with. So it's good for that. Exactly. But we'll keep our bison talk to maybe 5% of what goes on here. I'm fine talking about it. I just don't like being referred to as the bison guy. Well, if it's okay with you, we're going to talk to you for about 15 minutes, and then we have about 45 minutes scheduled with the bison. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> to get his side. Was he really being that threatening? Was that... <laughs> I know. I wish we could have seen the bison. There's not a version where we see him, right? No, I've been telling everybody, maybe when I got to the scene, I was probably about maybe 30 to 40 yards away from the bison. But the rule is at Yellowstone Park for bears and wolves, you need to be 100 yards away. And for all other wildlife, you need to be 25 yards away. So I'm positive that bison broke the 25-yard barrier. And for people who are maybe used to animals, they might have been fine with that 25-yard barrier. But me coming from the, the inner city of Baltimore, to me, that was too close. So did I overreact? I don't know. But I was worried about getting at a safe distance. <laughs> You don't need my defense, but in your defense, you know, I've been like fishing on, and like farm ponds and like a cow will come up behind you and like they're really big yes. animals. Even animals that are completely docile or the sheer mass of them is palpable when they're up next to you and you're like, oh my God. Yeah, I think I saw that males can get up to like 1,700 to 2,000 pounds or something like that. And I've been telling people, I think it was five or six of them. But the one that was closest to me didn't break eye contact with me. They are pretty docile animals. It didn't look aggressive, but it kept looking at me. So I just figured if his eyes are fixated on me, it wants to get closer to see what, I don't know, it was just curious. And I didn't want to be the cat that got killed by curiosity. Well, I'll have you know that when I just look up bison guy on Google, you are not among the top. There's somebody that's in jail for <laughs> abusing a bison in Yellowstone or something. So. There's hope for you yet, Dion. Yes, yes. I've probably covered that story. I guess as a first, just a thing to throw out, this podcast normally covers pop culture issues. We've talked about Spider-Man and Legos, and but we haven't had a straight-up news one before. But I kind of feel like news is entertainment, or rather the way that I interpret entertainment is just our diet of stuff that we distract ourselves with. So we're not just automatons walking around doing our jobs and... Fulfilling our responsibilities. So I part of what I wanted to explore here is why I don't tend to care about local news. I read a lot of news, like way more than is useful to me, way more than I could possibly act on. And often it's variations of the same damn story, you know, in different publications. But local news, for whatever reason, has not risen to the entertainment threshold. So I, just to start, what do you think about that idea of is news entertainment or how do you even think of that? I don't think news is entertainment, but... It can be entertaining. My bison video, for example, has been entertaining to people. And that's been something that's been used for a lot of newscasts during the time it came out. I understand why you don't find local news as entertaining or as, you know, you don't want to really watch it. For me, I find it useful. One thing I always tell people, I'd rather have useful information in my head versus useless information. Like when my friends tell me Cardi B did this, I think to myself, that's useless information that's now in my brain. So I just found it useful, you know, that can help me navigate through life. We actively try to make it entertaining with good stories. That doesn't happen every day. Sometimes the stories just find us. One thing I tell young journalists is 
the time you get the most viewers when something big happens. Like two weeks before the Bison video, there was a murder in West Yellowstone. It's like right outside of Yellowstone National Park and it's in Alvirin area. These grandparents and this uncle, they're accused of killing their grandson slash nephew. And stuff like this doesn't happen in Montana and it made national news. And I'll admit the news in Montana is pretty slow, but when I covered that story, I just think to myself, a lot of people are going to be tuning in tonight because they're curious about this story. So I think the average person doesn't really probably watch the news that much. I don't want to call it entertainment, but some might be entertained by a good story, which causes them to tune in that day. Where I get my kick or my feel is when there's a big story and I know more people are going to be watching. It seems like there's a really big difference between something that is of interest just because it's a story that piques people's curiosity. It's not like those grandparents were going on a murder spree and they needed to lock their doors and be vigilant. But a bridge that's out or you need to close your doors because someone dumped something out. I mean, there really is super useful news that's very useful and really of completely limited interest to the people that it's affecting. And I, I think that's something that local news can only give you. I mean, you can, yeah, people can post on Facebook, hey, this bridge is out, whatever, but other people expect to get updates. All right, how is this coming along? You know, I never completely stopped consuming it, but I've just maybe because of my age, I've never really been a newspaper subscriber because that's not how I consume. And I think with time shifting of how we watch stuff, I, my in-laws turn on the news at 5.30 or 6 or whenever they turn it on because that's when it's on in their house, right? Things are on in my house when I want to watch them. And it's just a completely different mindset of the 6 o'clock news. So Brian, do you normally watch a 24-hour news network or do you watch it on streaming online or what? You know, it's mostly when a story has a, a clip that goes along with it. it. It does tend to be more national news than local news. And part of it is there is a paywall to get into a lot of local news. And I'm living in St. Louis right now. And I don't think I can just pull up the post dispatch without paying for it. And I have elected to spend my local news budget on some other things. And I know that gets into print versus Dion doing broadcast, but there's a lot of overlap now, right? And I could see a video and some one video will be produced by a news channel and another will be produced by a traditional newspaper. And as a consumer, do I really care who's making it as long as it's a compelling story that's giving me the information? that I'm interested or the information I need. I don't know the answer to that. See, I'm old school. I prefer to watch like a newscast and the newspaper because in my mind, these smart people or people I believe to be smart, that's not always the case, but they're gathering this information for me and just putting it into this 30 minute newscast versus me having to take time out of my day to search for these individual stories. But I've realized a lot of people aren't like that. They rather just scroll Facebook and come across, you know, a Facebook post from my news station saying that this bridge is closed. So Erica doesn't really have the local news experience because she's in New York. So I read the New York Times and the Washington Post. That's like where I got most of my news or just the Apple News feed that will give me things from wherever it, you know, randomly gets stuff. You know, that's the only reason I would ever read a thing from Fox News. But Erica, what's this? Do you even have a local news experience or do you read the Ozarks news to keep in touch with, you know, what, what's going on with your folks? Yeah, I'm from Southern Missouri. So I have a huge local news experience because I grew up in a very small town where we had the Mansfield Mirror and we were good friends with the man who ran that for years and years. And he just recently retired. And I don't know that the newspaper is still going now. Like it was not easy for him to do it by himself for so long anyway. I mean, he only worked with like a couple other people, but he was at every event, you know, growing up. So I had a really positive experience with the news. Our newspaper was oftentimes pretty funny. And I mentioned holding my 12 point book because I feel like half of the news stories we got were kids with their kills during deer season or with their turkeys. It was that it was school awards. It was like a tornado ripped through town. So like, here's what's going on with that. I actually found it extremely consumable in that format as well, Dion, because you're getting things that matter to you. And then when you watch the six o'clock news, that was like the regional news that made sense to you on a different level. To me, the difference between like national news and local news was more so like at the time, the national news definitely felt much more like 
long-term investigative stories, whereas local news could be current. And of course, that all changed. And I I remember seeing it change during 9-11 with 24-hour news networks. That's when I specifically remember seeing the news on all the time and paying attention less to the local news at that point. But I don't think I was smarter for it by any means. And I think we'd lose a lot of perspective when we only look at national stories. And I know like for living in New York, yes, we do have local news and it is helpful to see something that just happens in my neighborhood in New York. But honestly, if I see smoke coming from a building, I'm going to look at Twitter and say what's going on in in my neighborhood. (laughs) But that's a different thing altogether, I guess. That's why we're on Facebook and Twitter, because we know people prefer to go there first. I mean, I still think local news is important because a lot of times we localize national stories like the meat shortage. We did a story on that like last week and I did a story on price gouging yesterday. People want to know, okay, this this is happening on a national level, but is it happening here? I think that's what makes us valuable because we can show people yes or no, this is happening here. Where, Dion, exactly in Montana? Are you... Bozeman. It's like an hour and a half north of Yellowstone National Park. Okay. And sort of how wide is that? It's not like Bozeman specific. If I was a Madison news report, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, then it's kind of Madison and the suburbs. But with less density of cities, how how wide is your reach there? Well, my viewing area is Bozeman Butte. So Butte is the next closest city, which is about an hour and a 15 minutes. I know our viewing area is probably maybe 70,000 people. But what makes Montana unique is we have sister stations across the state. So the company that owns my station, we have stations in Butte, Bozeman, Missoula, and Kalispell. And the distance between the farthest stations is mine in Bozeman and then the one in Kalispell, which is five hours away. So honestly, pretty much the whole western half of the state sees my stories. Wow. If you could stick it out a little longer, there's going to be a big news story in Bozeman in about 43 years. The warp drive is going to be, uh, you know, and then they're going to build the whole statue. It's exciting things are coming to Bozeman. So just in Star Trek lore, is that what you're? <laughs> That's from uh, Star Trek First Contact. Of course, you know, you, you hear a thing, you got to say it. Sorry. <laughs> 43 years is a little too long for me to wait. (laughs) What other local markets have you been in and what, what, how has that compared to where you are now? So I graduated college in 2015 and I worked as an assignment editor and a web producer in Baltimore for two years before I became an on-air reporter. And it's like night and day because, you know, when you want to get your start in front of the camera, you have to start small because you, you know, you have to prove yourself to the big leagues. When I worked in Baltimore, you know, since I'm out on camera, it's easier to move through the ranks because, you know, you don't have to worry about how you look and sound on TV. And it was harder because there's a lot more pressure in bigger markets. Like market size is based off of population. Bozeman is market 185 and Baltimore is market 26. So it's the 26th largest viewing area in the country. And the pressure was just like intense. Like the second something happened, I better have it up online within five minutes and constantly updating. It wasn't a hard adjustment coming to Bozeman at all. It left me wanting that fix. Since I've been here in Bozeman, I've probably got that fixed probably two times versus in Baltimore. I probably got that fixed like two or three times a week. It does give you a little bit more time, though, to investigate a story, though, I I assume, right? And really fact check and... Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I just feel like those opportunities aren't here. Like, you know, in in Baltimore, you can do an investigation piece on corruption within the city. You guys probably saw the uh, mayor who had the book deal with the hospital, which was unethical, and that got her fired and put in jail. Maybe things like that happened in Montana, but I haven't come across them yet. So my investigation pieces, I mean, you can call it an investigation, and I'm not trying to put Montana on the back burners by no means, but as a reason, it's a small market because you normally don't get news like that. No, I see why when you think of that kind of investigative piece as the pinnacle of what you want to be doing, why that's actually producing political change, right? That's not entertainment because it's actually doing something in the world as opposed to even if a murder or something is a big news story, it's still like, well, why do people want to know about that? Other than it being in your town, which would be freaky, 
like even just like somewhere else in the state, there's a murder happening. Like that's not of any inherent interest to me more than something happening in Arizona or whatever. It's just a matter of like how horrific is it or I think the best invest I, I don't even want to call it investigative because you know like investigative can mean you know anything but in our minds investigating means like uncovering dirt but the best like long piece i've done in bozeman you know bozeman is this booming city we have yellowstone we have big sky resort like big sky is where all the celebrities go like the kardashians justin timberlake kelly clarkson has been camped out here during the coronavirus pandemic that caused the Bozeman to boom because it gave Bozeman popularity with all these people traveling through the city. Bozeman gets 4 million people who travel through the city every year because of Yellowstone and Big Sky. So I did a story about how the airport expanded and how it was like the big rollers who have like the celebrities and stuff come to like Big Sky and all those like big properties down there. They put up money to get flights brought to Bozeman. If you got these rich people coming in, we need flights to get them here. So they put their money up to back the airports to say, look, if you give us two planes once a week and you need to make $70,000 to make a profit, if you get X amount of number of people and that covers $50,000, we'll cover the rest of the $20,000 for you and we'll see how long this works until it's profitable. And I did that story and that was uh, probably my best investigative piece. Because it showed people there was a time when Bozeman didn't have direct flights to New York, didn't have direct flights to Seattle. But because these people who get these celebrities and these affluent people to come out here, that helped generate more flights from this small little town in Montana. I mean, that's kind of cool, you know, because everyone flies. But like that has been like, I guess, the pinnacle of my investigative career so far here in Montana. And I don't think it's fair to say that our interest in this stuff is only prurient because when it comes to a murder, as Mark mentioned, we want to know that justice is being served or when it comes to the airport, right? This is taxpayer money. There's an airport commission or are they being good stewards of public funding? They could, should they be doing something that is serving other people rather than celebrities understanding also that tourists drive? I mean, there's, there's a valid reason to want to know what's going on. If nothing else, where you pay your taxes, right? And it's not to be too cynical, but you're a, a member of the community and you want to know what's happening there. So I think that's great. People who live in Montana have a general interest in the news from what I've seen since I've been here. But a lot of people, especially my age or around my age, they come here for the great outdoors to uh, whitewater rafting, to hike, snowboard and ski. So I haven't seen a real big interest in local news, like compared to a place like the Midwest, for example. I always hear the Midwest is like, they're very into local news. We do. We love our local news. <laughs> and this is one thing I was thinking about with you is I still remember the name of our main news people when I was growing up and they were celebrities to us. Absolutely. Like I, as a child, I didn't really know the difference in Steve Grant and Lisa Rose were the big deal. I saw them just as important as I, as I would a national news person. You know what I mean? Do you find that to be the same? I think that there's something really special about local news, how you can be a local celebrity and you can actually be a hero to children who look at you on TV and be like, oh my God, I, I want to do this because I actually met him. I would say it's less now because back then there were like four channels. So people didn't have the choice but to watch those people. But uh, hero, <laughs> I don't know the word hero. I mean, now it's different for me now because I'm pretty much known all over the country. But before the whole Bison video, People do confide in me and especially when there's something that's going on and they want it to be uncovered, people will come to me and the local celebrity thing, I guess so. Like I said, it's not as big as it probably was back then, but people do enjoy, like I've, I've had one person who wanted to take a picture with me before the Bison video and I've done that and people do get excited when they see me in public. But I don't like to think of myself as a, I hate that term, local (laughs) celebrity, because I thoroughly enjoy what I do and I, I do feel comfort in knowing that people turn to me and it takes time to build those relationships. I'm comfortable in saying like people come to me like, Hey, I want to know this. Can you look into it? And I think that also speaks to your work. If people see your work and they admire it or they respect it, then they're more inclined to reach out to you. So many forms of entertainment, I'll use that word, 
have become more niche. You know, when everybody knew the jazz celebrities, now there's a smaller number of people into jazz, but they're really into jazz. So I'm wondering if as a similar thing happened, even if there's been a local news, I, I guess it's going to vary a lot depending on where in the country you are. And the more rural you are, maybe the more power local news still has as compared to Erica's situation in New York. But yeah, whether there's a cult following now of, or is it just demographic that it's like all the people over 70 totally recognize you? It's old people. <laughs> yeah. Like when I'm out and about, all older people know me. The first time I got recognized by a young person was last week. It was a kid and he said, are you the guy from the bison video? I was the first, he probably was probably about 17, 18 years old. And that was the first time I was recognized by a young person. So I guess that's not quite a cult implies that you have to do something to seek it out. Whereas the older people like, this is just what we've always done. I don't know what you're, <laughs> why you're changing everything. <laughs> exactly. What made you want to get into this? You know, like, it sounds like you're in it for the right reasons. It sounds like you're not, you know, you're not doing it to just be the next big news TV star. You find responsibility and comfort and joy in having people trust what you say is true and, and bringing them information that's important. It's uh, growing up in Baltimore. I mean, it's like the real life wire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Corruption. And I've always felt like people on the news should represent the people they're talking to. And Baltimore is a last time I checked around like a 65 percent black city. And I've always wanted to go into sports. But my senior year of college, I took news reporting. You know, when you do anything journalism related, you got to learn the basics, regardless if it's sports or news. But the basics is pretty much news. I covered the Freddie Gray protest my senior year of college. And I was in awe. I saw like Lester Holt. I saw Gerardo Rivera. I just saw all of these national news outlets, all these local local news outlets. I mean, it just struck a chord with me. And that's when I got the bug because I told my professor that and he said, you just, you just got bit by the bug. And I value a good story being told. And I take pride in a good story being told. Like I hate superhero movies because I think it's just a watered down story and they try to sell you on the CGI and actions. I prefer to see a movie like Dallas Buyers Club or, you know, something nominated for an Academy or award because I know or most likely it's going to be a, a well told story. But I think to sum it up, I just wanted to be a voice for my people because I know, like say there's a, a murder or something like that. If I go into that neighborhood as a white guy, they might not be inclined to talk to me. But if I go into that neighborhood and they see, oh, OK, he's black like me, he grew up in the urban community like me, this guy may not be so bad. And plus, I can relate to him. So let me go tell him my story. And in Montana, the people are just nice. And, you know, <laughs> if you're nice back to them, <laughs> they'll pretty much tell you anything you wanted to know. I remember when that murder the 12 year old boy was allegedly murdered by his grandparents and uncle. I was so nervous because it was so rural and people in Montana have guns. And I was just like, Oh my God, man, if, if I get shot, they're never going to find my body. And I've been doing this for at least like a year and a half up until this point. And the first guy I saw, I mean, you know, it is in Montana. We got the big guys with the beards and, you know, it's cold, so they're rugged. They, like, they call him Montana Tough. I'm like, man, this guy going to yell at me and tell me to get off his property. He started singing like a canary. He told me everything. And I was just shocked because, I don't know, maybe it's just my personality. But, like, I mean, it's what you live for as a journalist, you know, to get that person to talk to you. And, you know, it's like police officers. They need, like, criminal informants. And the same can be said as a journalist. You need like an informant or that's like, that's the way I like to think about it. So being able to relate to those people to get them to talk to you can make your story better than the competitions. And I'm very, I'm very competitive. Kobe Bryant <laughs> is my favorite athlete of all time. And I love to kick the competition's butt. So that day, you know, I watched the competition. We all covered the same story that day, but I'm the only guy who interviewed someone in the neighborhood. I'm the only guy who has a family member as an interview, you know? I think that competitive drive, wanting to represent my community when I get the chance to in the future, and the art of storytelling is what made me want to do this. So you went to an extremely white state. I'm looking at the demographics. or It looks like it says here, Black or African American alone is less than 1%. Are you almost a, an oddity? You have a different experience maybe than you would being in a place, you know, here in St. Louis 
or I'm in St. Louis County. Black people are, are a minority, but it's not unusual. When I first was getting job offers, I had one from Peoria, Illinois, and no offense to Peoria, but it, is the, it looked like a place I didn't want to be. And I was just like, Ugh. then I was talking <laughs> to a TV station in the South, uh, Macon, Georgia, and I wasn't too keen on going to the South because my family, they're from South Carolina. And I just, I don't like the, the heat, the humidity and the bugs. I mean, beggars can't be choosers when you want your first job on air. And then Montana called me out of the blue. And I'm thinking there's no way in hell I'm going to white Montana. There's no way in hell. But I like what I was hearing. My boss has had like follow-up interviews, Skype interviews. And I remember my boss, he showed me, like he turned his webcam around and showed me the mountains outside of his office. And I thought to myself, that means nothing to me. Like I'm from the city. I do not care about no mountains. But I like what I heard and I ended up here. And my mentors have been telling me, you know, stand out in a small market. Like literally, it's a small market and I'm a black guy in a white state. So I think that helps. I'm certain I'm one of the most recognizable, even before the Bison video, I'm one of the most recognizable faces in Montana. You know, there are like some older people who've been here for, for forever, but it was just so easy for me to stand out. Even if someone doesn't know my name, they say, oh, I've seen you before. That gives them a little bit of comfort instead of being just some random reporter. It's like, oh, I've seen this guy before. And that might give me a little bit more leverage to get them to talk to me, you know? Mark and I both grew up in the Chicago area. So I'm not going to say Peoria is the punching bag of the state, <laughs> but you wouldn't be the first person to, to keep driving. So, <laughs> But that was another thing. So we were in a suburb. And so what does local news mean? Like everybody read the Chicago Tribune or the Sun-Times. I don't even know what the Northbrook publication was. It was called the Northbrook Star. The Pioneer Press put out all of these cookie cutter publications in the suburbs. Each suburb had their own and there was a part that was all the same. And then a part that just had or the local news that was just for us. And I think the only time I ever read it was when my name appeared in it or when one of my siblings and someone cut it out and it went in the scrapbook. It just felt like a vanity project. Even if it was just something stupid, like there I am playing baseball or whatever. I was like, oh, putting this one in the scrapbook. But, you know, I don't know. Movie times? I don't know what we did with that thing. It's the same with the Baltimore Sun. They have certain sections dedicated to like Baltimore County. Yeah, I was just watching the new Ricky Gervais show, Afterlife, where he plays a local news reporter in some rural part of England and makes the positive claim that like the local news coverage is nobody actually wants to read that. It's more for the people who are actually being featured and their relatives. In your experience, like what percentage of the news that you have to report on would be considered vanity projects in the way that Brian is talking about? Well, in Montana, I would say a lot. And I don't like that. Like, I like hard news. We cover so many, like, so-and-so had a bake sale today. There was a parade today. I'm just like, I do not care. <laughs> I mean, I, I know the news is negative because, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. But I also think of importance. And I'm just thinking, like, is it really important that there was a parade? And I get it. You know, you have to show people that good things are still happening. I get that. But how important is that? So. I probably get more feedback from people who are being featured in a good story or a, a moderately good story or a story that needs to be told that isn't as hard, I would say, versus like that the murder I told you about. I mean, that's, that was probably the biggest story that's happened here in a while. Damn it, everybody knew about that story. But the majority of the time, it's we're starting this new program to get high school kids into the working force right after graduation. That's normally just the people who it affects, you know. You know, I might interview the principal. We love this program. I'm excited to see this tonight. But rarely do you see, oh, did you see that story on this and that, blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't see it. Like, no one pays attention, in my opinion. But then when it's like a big story, that's when people pay attention. Versus in Baltimore, everybody watches the news. Um, well, maybe, it's, I mean, the population is so big, you'll run into people who watch the news consistently. The reason why, because the, the majority of it is bad. You know, this police officer was shot. This grandmother was hit by a stray bullet. Like in Baltimore, people pay attention, but I get it because it's more sexy. It's also difficult in a smaller market to write negative stories about people, I would assume. Yes. Right? Like, because they feel too personal. 
Yeah. Um, I got an ex, I mean, I'm not going to say any names and I got to be really vague with this because I can easily give it away in a small town. But there was one story I covered. They didn't like me covering the story because, you know, they like to be viewed as this great entity, but something that rubbed people the wrong way happened. And it's my job to cover it. As a result of that, this person, I believe, I, I can't confirm this, but I believe this person won't talk to me anymore because I covered this story and I can give two rats. It's like, it's my job <laughs> to cover this. I will say like in a place like Montana is really nice. And the reporters, I was the only reporter who covered that story because you try to shy away not to burn bridges. I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't burn bridges. You know, I'm fair. But I questioned why the other two stations didn't cover this story. I mean, it was a good story because I was getting feedback from people in the community. It was a niche story that didn't affect too many people, but it affected enough people to where I got feedback. And there was no mention of it whatsoever at, at the other two stations. And my mind is this, oh, they just scared to go at the throne. I'm from Baltimore, man. Like, we're brash. Like, I don't <laughs> care if you don't like me or not, but I'm going to do this story. There's this saying, maybe you've heard it, Erica, where my in-laws are from in Kansas, in these small towns that if people start talking, they'll say, well, if we talk long enough, we'll figure out how we're related. <laughs> <laughs> there could be some of that going on, Dion. And it's really interesting that you bring that up, Erica, about sort of that, that personal aspect of it, because I've spent, not now, but the last 20 years of my life in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is a quarter million people. Yeah, I know a lot of people who are mentioned in the news. And that was an experience I had in the Chicago area, certainly not on the, the Chicago news. And it makes a huge difference because you're so colored by, well, I know that person. So immediately, if something bad is being said about them, your instinct is to have this disconnect. It's like, well, no, I, it doesn't seem right to me. I'm not calling the reporter a liar, but you do have this emotional response based on a relationship. It wouldn't be human not to. Yeah, that was a story I covered. I got to be very vague again, but someone got in trouble. And ultimately, this person was cleared of this trouble. And it's a small community. So I reached out to this person. I'm thinking to myself, this person isn't going to speak to me because they want to just put this stuff behind him or her. And then the person agreed to do the interview. I mean, ultimately, this person was cleared of any wrongdoing, but I was shocked that this person wanted to do the interview with me. And I had so much respect for this person because I was like, wow, like you're putting your, your neck out there. I will never forget that because in Montana, a lot of times when you contact people about good stories, they're quick to get back. But the second you contact them about bad stories, they don't want to talk to you. And I'm like, no, you got to take the girl with the bat and the crookets with the straights. So, you know, sometimes you, you have to do your fair share of good stories to get them to talk to you on the bad. But sometimes with me, is if you don't talk to me on a bad story, I'm reluctant to do a good story on you. I, I mean, that's how the industry works. You know, I, I give you two or three good stories. You know, I'm, as long as it's newsworthy, I might say like it's just like fluffy pieces. If it's like a good newsworthy story, I'll do it. But, um, you know, in these small markets, we have more power to choose what stories we want and don't want to do. I remember that. Like, okay, you didn't want to talk to me for this. All right, don't come. For, I'm not going to talk about how your kid's having a birthday party or something like that. <laughs> you gave way too much information on that story, though, Dion, because <laughs> whatever, you know, I know what you're talking about. And he or she is going to be pretty angry. So <laughs> there's a lot of talk about information bubbles regarding national news and people getting through the internet and people that leave, just leave on Fox or just leave on MSNBC or whatever. Is the local news been kind of insulated from that? Like I know with papers, it was often two big papers in Madison. There, there was a sort of more liberal paper and a more conservative paper, but then the liberal one is out of business. So now there's what, like, what is that, the political kind of situation in terms of the available TV channels and things in, in your area? Like I say, Montana is a really nice place. So even if people do disagree, it's not like, was it Charlottesville, Virginia, where that rally happened? You won't see things like that. But most of the time, these news stories aren't really divisive because it, it affects like a, a niche or a specific group of people. So I haven't come across any divisive stories. The one I can think of is two weeks ago, 
people went to the state capitol to protest to lift the coronavirus restrictions. My TV station, we're owned by Sinclair. I don't know if you know Sinclair. They had that campaign or that must run a few years ago where everyone was saying the same thing and is really conservative. So I've had like two or three instances where people said, you know, what station do you work for? And I say NBC Montana. And they say, oh, I stopped watching you guys because all of the local stations in Montana used to be family owned, but they're being bought out by these bigger companies now. And once people in like places like Bozeman and Missoula, which are liberal, when they found out that we're being operated by a conservative company, they stopped watching us. Yeah, I'm looking at these uh, Sinclair Broadcasting paying 48 million civil, just there's the latest news. Folks can look that up for themselves. Right, but that was in 2018 where there was that must read. And it was across, and it was, right, Fox and CBS, ABC, whatever, whoever Sinclair owned. My takeaway wasn't so much that it was Sinclair and that they were conservative, though that was in that instance, but just this homogenization of local news into just sort of national owners sort of pushing out the same stories. And a lot of the ways that's happening in newspapers too. A family member worked for the Tribune in Chicago and they got away from a lot of stories they might normally cover and leaned on AP more and they used their resources for investigative journalism because the AP is not going to investigate red light cameras and corruption and other things going on in Chicago. And that's something that only they could do. So that was a better use of their resources. Yet, and people ask me, you know, do we cover like conservative stories or do we try to lean conservative to satisfy Sinclair? And I explained to them like at the local news level, well, for me as reporters anyway, sometimes anchors, they have to like read intros to like, you know, maybe a conservative leaning Sinclair story. But as far as local reporting, we try to do our best to be fair and unbiased. So there's never been any agenda pushed down on me where I need to slant a story a certain way. And if you truly love what you do, like, and if you love journalism the way I do, like, you know, that's disrespectful to the game. You know, you don't cheat the game. Kobe says that you don't cheat the game. And I would never disgrace the game by doing something like that. Every depiction of news on TV and movies, it's always the people in the executive suites in the suits. They're the bad guys who are, you know, pushing agendas and doing things. And you're the protagonist. You're the guy who's getting it done and finding the truth no matter the cost. So, you know, if we had your boss's boss's boss on, it might be a different conversation. But And that's, that's the more sexy side, too. My side is the boring side. <laughs> that's why they made a the movie uh, Bombshell. <laughs> Just to kind of circle back around, not purely talking about the bison, but in general, the memification. The big story about local news is just, oh, the, the internet has caused trouble for all newspapers. And so many things are becoming more centralized. And so we're just going to get more of this, you know, whether it's by the same company buying out all these places or just the way people consume things, everything is becoming more homogenized. And so that gives us a disconnect to local news. But the bison story at least shows us that there's a potential connectivity that, you know, since you're using the internet as well, anything be- can become national at any point in time. It's not going to be getting to know the new soccer coach. Like that kind of local story is not going to become national, but virtually anything else, you know, if you film a cute animal, <laughs> like how do you see that in terms of this? It seems like there's more of a continuum between the local and the national than there was because of this channel. What triggered in my mind was we had two schools or one school open yesterday. But, you know, Montana is really rural. So like they have the small enough community where they can do something like that. And that made national news because we're you know, one of the first schools to reopen during the coronavirus pandemic. And as much as CNN and all these other national publications can broadcast it, we're the only ones who are at the school and interviewing teachers and parents. So I think, you know, that's where local journalism comes into play. And with the internet or social media, anyone can share or type up a story. But at the end of the day, we're still the ones who could get the most retweets or favorites or likes because we're actually at the scene showing people what to see. So I think that still makes us valuable. We still get contacted by CNN. We still get contacted by these national news outlets for our local content. And yeah, we're competing against more now. And yes, you know, if we're all being bought by the same 
company, we're going to have the same stories pop up on our timeline. I'm in it for the big stories. Like when Yellowstone closed, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I think the other reporters were there too. Minus the Bison video, you know, I'm one of the, what, one of the few reporters who can show people around the country or around the world that Yellowstone is empty <laughs> and there are a bunch of bison around because there are, no, there are no humans around. So I think that's where our value come in. Like with the West Yellowstone, or with the story with the grandparents accused of killing their grandson, CNN shared that. You know, all these people shared it. But at the end of the day, I'm still the only one who talked to the sheriff in the police department and to the mom. So those, those national outlets still have to come to me to get that content. And there's an element of trust. I would be much more likely to talk to a local news person and feel like they had my best interest at heart than somebody who is a national reporter. Exactly. Right. You're an actual journalist and you have standards. I mean, anyone can write anything, but CNN knows that any, if you've said something, it's been vetted, you have to stand behind it the way some schmuck with a keyboard doesn't have to, right? Exactly. Sometimes I sing and dance around the house in my underwear. doesn't make me Madonna, never will, as it says in Working Girl. So. <laughs> yeah. They make a lot more money to do less work, so maybe they got it right and not me. <laughs> nah. At the end of the day, you can lie down and sleep in your bed and have a clear conscience. If I can afford the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, I hope good things come from this video and that it gives you the opportunities you need to like afford an actual bed and not just a mattress on the floor, you know? <laughs> a bison fur bed. with. A... <laughs> hey, listen, I'm an actor. I understand you have to take your opportunities where they come. So if this is your first claim to fame, then it's not an embarrassing one and it could have been a lot worse. So like... It... A lot of people said that, yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us. So good to talk to you. Yeah, you've been absolutely lovely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Folks, we're going to talk a little more for the uh, supporters, patreon.com slash pretty much pop. But we're going to say goodbye to Dion. So long, listeners. Bye. So long. Get more pretty much pop at pretty much pop.com. Pretty much pop is part of the partially examined life podcast network. And it's also presented by openculture.com.